welcome to Fiber Trek. My name is Sarah. Welcome. You are most welcome on this creative journey here in the North Woods of Maine. On this edition, I give a little glimpse into the beginnings of spring and our daily life. I share a few books I've added to my library. There is a quilting update, and I will share with you what I am doing with my knitting. If you are a patron of this podcast or have donated through coffee, a deep heartfelt thank you. Financial contributions really helps to offset production costs as well as encourage and motivate more skills and more vlogs. For those that have left comments, shared or liked, thank you so much. I'm so glad you're here. Let's catch up. following me for a while, you'll know that usually the quilting productivity strikes in summer once I am done commuting for work and I can settle into my home and really just sink into my space without the demands of travel and um, some of the organization that goes around that. And this baby quilt that I worked on for a friend has kind of invigorated some other projects and other feelings about quilting in my space. <laughs> so you'll have seen that I did quilt the baby quilt on my machine and it was all going swimmingly. I was using some tips and tricks from Jackie Gerding's book, Walk. I had decided on doing a cross hatch pattern, so um, quilting it on the diagonal on each side. And I had initially been marking it um, with chalk or with tape. And that wasn't working for me. So I grabbed my chalk pencil and I marked my lines and I quilted away. <clears throat> At the end of that, uh, I decided I wanted to try to remove the chalk and it wouldn't come off the fabric. At this point, uh, of course, I had not secured any of the uh, two and a half inch 
binding onto it. Um, it still was just the quilt sandwich. And I decided to test out a few solutions to my problem. I, d I will tell you that I went very despondent and dark about this, this problem. Um, because it wasn't coming off with any of the ideas I had around removing marks, um, such as a little cold water, I tried done dishwashing liquid, I tried a magic eraser because that was recommended online, nothing was working. I was hesitant to put it in the washing machine, so I was really at a standstill creatively with how to solve my problem. And I was like ready to scrap it. I did at one point contemplate making a whole new quilt top and putting it on top and seeing if I could rectify it that way. Um, and eventually, you know, I did ask Rob about it, my husband, and he was like, well, you're not throwing it away. You can fix this. And I was like, I can't, I don't know what to do about it. And it felt very unnerving and disconcerting to have a project sitting in that type of limbo. So I figured what's done is done and it can't get any worse. And if I'm going to just chuck it or scrap it, I might as well wash it and see what I can do. So I threw it um, in a hot wash to, to see if that would loosen the chalk. And I know this is a very kind of um, novice mistake. I know you're supposed to test these things. I was moving through on the assumption that this is chalk and you can wipe it off. And I've seen people use chalk to make quilting lines before, um, but I didn't recognize or maybe think about the fact that this chalk might have additive in it or, you know, might have a wax in it. So anyway, I chucked it in because I had nothing to lose, which can be a really great place to be solving problems from. Um, so you can just try a bunch of different things. And through that experimentation, you can obviously build some wisdom about what's gonna happen on your next quilt. So this could be that kind of sacrificial thing. It came out, uh, fair, it, it, it had lessened the marks. And so I felt um, hopeful. And when I got to my mom's, I had read that OxyClean might be helpful. So I used spray and wash along all of the chalk lines and I washed it in hot water and it came out mostly clean. So I went from like despondent to satisfied. Um, I'm still happy to give this as a gift. And um, yeah, so I, at that point, I think I had put the binding on and I put it in the washing machine. Nothing got wonky, so I was relieved. I did wash this twice in hot water, and I have since bound it, and it is finished. I hand bound the back, and I'm gonna wash it one more time and put it in the dryer, and then that will be going off for good. Now, this quilt brought up some sentiment. Um, it's good to wrestle with those ideas, right, around failure, and um, and then the par sometimes that paralyzing, um, unknowing piece of what to expect from your fabric or what to expect from, you know, when it comes out and all those things that can ugh, just be a resistance um, to moving forward. So once that piece was done, um, I took a look at what was out on my table and it was the Stars Upon Stars quilt. I'm just gonna grab that because I have it right here. If you're not familiar and you haven't been with me for the past four years, uh, this is that block. This is by Laundry Basket Quilts. And I have been working on another block and I have been practicing piecing the eight point stars and the Y seams on my Singer Featherweight because I was having more luck with precision on that. Part of that was the sewing plate is a single hole versus the kind of oval oblong hole, which is a recommended, uh, um, this is I'm looking for. It's a recommended um, advantage to it be more precise. And I just was like, I think I'm done. I just think that quilt and I have had our run together. I've learned a lot. Even though I was moving forward with, um, you know, achieving blocks that were, you know, the right size and fabrics, it was so painstakingly difficult for me. And I just, it was not, um, <laughs> well, it moved me forward in skill sets. It was not moving me forward in inspiration. And I put it away and I think I'm done. Um, 
I still think that quilt is absolutely beautiful. It might haunt me the rest of my life. Um, I will have this one block to remember it by. But um, yeah, I, I think I I didn't necessarily feel defeated. I just felt like I had accepted. <clears throat> the words failure and, and acceptance are gonna come up, I think, a lot, because we're gonna talk about that with my knitting. But I just accepted the fact that this was out of my realm of completion. And it felt really good to pack it all up and put it away and just dismiss it from the lineup, from my brain space, from the planning. And, um, and by doing that, I made some room to think about another project, which has some resistance around it, uh, which is Cameron's, uh, star pop quilt. This is the same pattern as I did for my niece a while back and I'm using fish fabrics from Free Spirit Fabrics and I've kind of fallen out of love with it. As I sat and thought about this because you know this is low stakes risk assess you know risk taking stuff which is why I like doing that here in with my quilts and my yarn and my painting. It doesn't matter if it's messed up. It doesn't matter if um it doesn't work out, you know, there's, it's a low stakes investment with high opportunity to build skill around problem solving and decision making and executive uh, function and organization, all those things. So you can pick that up with low stakes and you can put it into a high stakes space and, and build some skill around that. So high stakes would be like for me in my professional life as speech pathologist, you know, high stakes for my husband on his rescue work and all these places where, you know, people's, <clears throat> other people are involved or affected. You know, nobody's going to be sad if my painting looks awful um, and, or, you know, nobody's going to be greatly affected, like, you know, functionally by that. So again, like I said, it's great to work with those feelings in this space uh, because again, it just builds some resilience and skill around managing it and the bigger world. All that to say, when I thought about this quilt, Cameron's quilt, you know, I was really trying to think about where am I in this project? Because there, for me, there's kind of the dreaming space there's the gathering and planning, there's the production and execution, and then there's the completion and the, sometimes the admiration, um, but there's that kind of satisfying completed space, the finishing, that type of, um, those are kind of the four uh, progressive steps that I see when I look at a project. And for Cameron's, I'm in production, but I have no sustenance to keep going. Um, and so I was trying to figure out, well, what do I need in order to, move on this project and not feel like I've hit a wall. And I think the important piece for me on that particular project is to go back to a little dreaming and gathering to get some, as I said, sustenance to execute this. Um, and part of that was dedicating myself to pulling together four blocks um, so chunking it into smaller pieces, not thinking about the whole quilt and what I have to do and I need to cut this and this didn't work out, but just to chunk it into a smaller piece, complete those four and then move on and do another piece of that creative um, process. And so <clears throat> that's what I practiced um, this the past couple of weeks. So part of the dreaming phase was I ran into a quilt or a fabric by Mia Chero for, from, from Free Spirit Fabrics. And these had dog portraiture on it and different dog fabrics. And it was so sweet. I knew it would be perfect for Madison. And she had used the Bridges quilt. And I decided I wanted to make that as well. It's a very low, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, it's minimally pieced. They're big, long pieces with sashing, and then you put it together. So it's more of a... Um, exemplary quilt for the fabric. So I like that. And when I was looking at Mia Chero's illustrative uh, fabrics, I found this one, which I thought would be perfect for Annie, because now I have another niece to make quilts for. So I picked this up and um, I'm going to do the same quilt for Annie um, using these portraits as one of the piece panels. Um, so it has a really sweet, uh, cozy autumnal feel <clears throat> without being overly like, this is your fall quilt. Um, and 
yeah so this this fabric has come Madison's fabric by the same illustrator and designer is coming from Hancock Hancock of Paducah Paducah Hancock's of Paducah I'm not really sure where that S goes um, and it was all on sale so that was even better and I got backing hold on um, so here's the border some more of the fabrics just really fun so that one's for Annie and Madison's getting the dogs they're gonna have these kids are gonna have so many quilts but um, and then in talking with Cameron, he's getting older. I think that's part of the reason this other quilt maybe has lost a little bit of its luster <clears throat> to me. Um, and he's just, he's just getting more mature. And I'm thinking about what kind of quilt I could do for him. The last quilt I made for his bed has Smokey the Bear fabrics on it and camping themes and forestry kind of themes. Um, but for this one, I think I'm going to use homespun fabrics. And these are... Um, a little bit more, they have a little bit uh, earthier feel, um, subdued. I mean, some of them are, you know, a little bit bright and cheerful, but for the most part, his quilt is going to be, he asked for navies and grays. And so I'll be reflecting that choice. Um, but they're like kind of plaids and um, solids. And so that's kind of what I'm leaning towards for him. Um, I'm not really ready to do anything about that. I'm just contemplating it and dreaming about it. Whereas the girls, obviously I moved to that kind of gathering and planning stage. Um, I think those quilts will come together much faster. And for Cameron's quilt, I know I want it to have some stars on it. I know I want it to have a bit of a primitive feel. Uh, versus a modern feel and I think that will highlight and showcase um, his personal aesthetic as well as those fabrics themselves <clears throat> so that's kind of been really like I said invigorating for moving forward on this other quilt and the other thing that I allowed my I allowed myself to do but the other thing I worked into my um production piece, instead of just focusing on getting that project done, getting that project done, was to work on my scrap quilt that I've been putting together for a while that includes foundation paper piecing, English paper piecing, and some string quilt, uh, some string blocks of old fabrics from different projects. And I didn't realize how much I enjoyed working with those string blocks and just seeing the different fabrics and thinking about the different projects that I've worked on and how much I actually loved those fabrics that I got. And I'm so glad that I'm going to have them in a quilt, you know, just kind of, um, all together instead of like, this is the, this quilt and this is this one or ones I've given away and I can kind of re reflect and remember on that. So I'm really quite happy with working on that and those blocks. Um, so everything is coming together, um, for the quilting. And like I said, that this early start, which is, interesting. Um, it's been a weird winter here in Maine. Uh, it's been a very mild winter, so we're having an early spring, and perhaps that's what's also playing into this rise out of dormancy and hibernation, <laughs> and um, this very kind of um, I find coming into the studio, being very productive, moving around, da, 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 thoughtful, versus like knitting cozy with my coffee on the couch. So those are two different, they satisfy two different elements of my nature. So coming out of that cozy couch knitting project piece um, and uh, into the spring kind of movement momentum. And so hopefully I can harness some of that, push forward on Cam's project and also finish up my scrap project. So that would be great to get those kind of things off and then allow summer to unfold with some new ideas and uh, new concepts, especially since I accumulated so much fabric and scrappiness for the stars upon stars. It might be nice to find a way to apply that and work with those fabrics because those are beautiful. So um, yeah, so I I feel like I've got my toe in a couple different places. I did a completion piece. I'm in some production piece. I'm in a gathering space and I've got some um, dreaming going on. So hopefully that will all kind of, you know, frame, put some frame, uh, a framework around um, my thoughts and pulling me together and, you know, that container of keeping my energy um, divided and balanced and all those things that go into having multiple projects on the go. With that being said, I am going to 
have another cup of coffee, I think, and uh, we'll start thinking about some knitting. I know it's nothing new, but it's so good to see you. We do this every day, and I'm still so amazed by you. So hold me tight through the night mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's just us two Recently, I was pleased to discover Alice Maccabee, a Japanese embroidery artist. I ordered two of her books, and I really wanted to share them here because I think it's helpful to be able to see a whole book in its entirety and see how it might fit into your own work or your own aesthetic and how it might fulfill a need in your library. I'm a huge fan of Yumiko Higuchi's work, who is another Japanese embroidery artist I have featured on this channel, and so I knew that this would probably be inspiring and lovely to look at. It is similar to other books that I have by her in that it has the projects in the beginning, examples, and in the back of the book is where you'll find tools and materials, techniques, any templates and any instructions for any of the projects. I also wanted to bring in beautiful botanical embroidery and I think this was the first book that she published. And again, similar to what I featured in the previous description, this book is also laid out similarly and having the beautiful projects and photography and all of that in the beginning. I'm so drawn to the linen, the colors. I like how clear the pictures are. You can really get a feel for the overall project, how to use it. So I have really enjoyed all of the books that I have gotten from Yumiko as well as this artist as well. I think she has a few others and I know that Yumiko Higuchi has a new one coming out. Uh, in May, I believe. So I'll be looking forward to that and sharing it with you. Wax wing, wax wing, what do you bring from the frozen north? Wax wing, wax wing, we've been waiting on you. I bring the amber that I have gathered on the northern seashore For the hatchlings I have fathered for thee
start to talk about the knitting. As I always like to do before I start, I just wanna thank those that contribute financially to this endeavor and this creative project. I greatly appreciate uh, that value is added to this uh, type of work, uh, working on editing and gathering shots and storylines and arcs and all that goes into production. Um, I know that I am not a Peter Jackson, I've said that before, um, although I aspire to be a better vlogger every time, um, but I so appreciate those that, again, support this work financially. If you are in a space to like or subscribe or share, any traction around the videos is most appreciated. And of course, I always appreciate the comments and insight that come my way. And I read everything. I haven't always had a chance to respond, but it is an important aspect of sharing and I am deeply grateful. That being said, the knitting will be a little thin. I have been dividing my time with friends and family, and in those moments, I don't often bring my knitting, especially with the children, because I just don't want to divide my attention, and I don't find it easy to do that when um, Annie, my youngest niece, uh, has just started to walk, and I, I really just want to be able to get up and get down and enjoy and be responsive and spontaneous uh, with them, and so I set the <laughs> knitting aside, and then, of course, going out with friends and some of just the overall um, investment in work and I play games with my mom at night when I'm down with them uh, as I commute. So the knitting has been kind of um, lingering on the periphery, if you will, as I've been traveling back and forth for my work and commute. But that being said, I made some gains on the Yell. I am knitting this. It is a uh, cardigan by Marie Wallen from her book Shetland. I'm using Spindrift yarn. I needed to deal with some color work issues that I was having. And at this point, I had knit a section using pine green and camel. And I was trying to move on from there and I was having a really hard time picking my next set of colors. Um, so I decided to rip it all back. The pine green was the problem, it needed to go. And I, I don't think I've ever really cataloged how I do this and I, I think it's a valuable skill to have because sometimes ripping back, I don't know, it's like 370 stitches on a US four, um, collar work maybe feels a bit yee about it. But um, what I like to do is take a smaller needle uh, for this particular, piece I used a US 3 and the nice thing about Marie's uh, projects is that there's often a solid you know transition line between the color work and so I was able to go right below the pine green and know which stitch I needed to pick up and I used that needle to pick up one leg of each stitch all the way around pulled it through and then you can you know unravel the work to that point and not have missed too many stitches. I think I had missed two um, and luckily this yarn is sticky enough that it holds its shape and you can scoop it up. So I ripped all the way back using that method and I decided to, I, I knew I still wanted to work with green and um, I needed to let go of kind of the rusts and cinnamons and nutmegs and so I ended up picking this seaweed green and it has a very subtle effect and it it achieves like what I really love about Marie Wallen which is this kind of watercolor um, uh, kind of aesthetic for her sweaters and um, everything just kind of blends but you still get this overall feeling and I think this seaweed green and this lighter color, which is also in the green family, but it has some brown overtones, uh, works and is and then enables me to move into the blue that I wanted to use and yellow ochre. <clears throat> so I'm really happy with how that's turned out. And I've, again, you know, we've talked about before in some of my episodes that those transition times, you set it aside and it just kind of lingers and lingers and lingers. And so it was great to kind of get that done and get back on track. Things, I, I was able to re-knit that section fairly quickly in a morning and get on to the next one. So, uh, and I already know where I'm going from there. So that, that little kind of planning and thoughtful time uh, is all done. I can just move into the production and um, knitting portion of that. So it felt good to do that. Um, I finished... 
uh, the Limey Mitts by Ronya Hakalito. And I've put together a little kit for myself from Scraps uh, for the uh, next set that I want to do. I really like the way these knit up. I think they're beautiful. Um, they are knit with Let Lopi. You know, they've got a heavier gauge. So again, they move very quickly and you can move through scraps. So that's awesome. And in doing that, I have a lot of uh, Alifoss Lopi leftovers from my sweater I knit from Ka for Cameron and a sweater I knit for myself. And I have found a pattern for them. So it feels good to kind of keep scraps um, going out and into the world to be used. Um, I needed to order needles, so I'm waiting on that. But again, kind of going through when these little bits and pieces surface, it's just, I, I'm just feeling so satisfied by utilizing them and getting them out and um, moving through uh, a lot of old stash that I have, as well as, again, leftovers. So that's done. Ronya Hakalito, Marie Wallen. I have been working on the sleeve of my Salalu mashup sweater from the Knitted Kalavala and the High Low sweater from Tidal Yarns. Um, I'm working on the sleeve. That tends to be what I gravitate to in general. And then the last one I've been put some time into, it doesn't always get as much attention even though I'm enjoying it, is the Roots and Shoots sweater by Tati Lutz Lutzak. This is in Nutidin from Anorak Air. And one color, the dark color, is a natural color. And then the kind of pinky yellow is a dyed in the wool. This is unspun yarn. I'm holding the natural color double and I'm holding the pinky yellow color with a strand of mohair to try to deal with my gauge. Now, the one thing I realized about this is I'm transitioning to a larger needle is that this neck opening um, is gonna pull and it's gonna show some of these floats um, on the inside. And so I think what I'm gonna have to do is uh, grab a small crochet hook, crochet that edge a little bit and uh, finish it at a little tension so that it closes up. Um, so I've I've been curious about that. I'm wondering about this and how it's gonna turn out. As I said, I, I don't often just gravitate, pick it up, because I find working with the new Tiden that it requires a little bit more attention and management, and so it doesn't always lend itself to those quick moments um, when I'm, you know, got a, you know, a little bit of time between one thing or another. But I am curious about how it's going to turn out, um, and so I have enough kind of wonderment about it that um, I'm still interested and in, um, want to get it done. So that I, I put some time into that, thoughtful about that. I do have some plans to cast on a project for my niece Annie and um, I'm hoping to knit something for her that will go um, forward to maybe neck this fall and into the winter. Um, I, it is a dress by Lisa Chemry, which name escapes me, but I have that all packed up and kitted. So if I wanted to cast that on, um, I'm ready to go. And I feel like I'm in a space to do that now that I've kind of moved through some of the transitional um, needs of my other sweater. So yeah, on that note, I think I'm gonna bid you a fond farewell and look forward to seeing you at the end of the month. And I have a studio vlog I'm putting together for patrons uh, coming out very soon. And yeah, so lots to look forward to. I hope wherever you are that uh, you're in good spirits. Many fond wishes and blessings. I will see you next time. Take care, bye.